We're on. This is the moment police moved in to arrest two criminals at the heart of one of the biggest manhunts in recent years. Let me complain and assist us, yeah? Just put your hands like that for me, all right? Everyone was desperate to find 16-year-old Becky Watts, who had disappeared without trace from her home in Bristol. Please come home. We love you so much. As hundreds of police across two counties searched for her, forensics teams picked through the detail. Approaching the address. Their cameras capturing every clue they found. The answers are always out there. The answers are always there. But as the hours went by, friends and family grew frantic. Something has happened, and we need to find her, and we need to find her fast. Now, the police's own recordings reveal that behind closed doors, detectives suspected two people did know where Becky was. I know you've got something to tell us. Mm. I can see it in your face. With time running out and the life of a missing 16-year-old girl at stake, how would they crack the case? The whole investigation is just set up to make sure that if she's still alive, we save life, that's our primary objective. For the first time, I've been given exclusive access to the hundreds of hours of footage the police filmed by the detectives who led the inquiry. It's a remarkable insight into the police investigation as they raced to uncover what had happened to Becky. Have you hurt her? No, I haven't hurt her. Do you know if she's alive? No. Missing. Okay. No one has seen her, no? No. We phoned around the family, all her friends have contacted us and asking where she is, and none of them know. What's her name? Uh, Rebecca Watts. I remember just being so confused as to where she was. She wasn't the type of person that would go somewhere and not tell people where she was going. She wasn't the kind of person to stay out late either. She'd always go to bed really early. Quite a few people, I believe, didn't really take the situation seriously. Like a lot of people were saying, well, she's just a teenager. She's not, she's just ran off or something like that. And I'm like, well, you don't know her though. So when you know somebody, you know that they, and you know they wouldn't do this, you know that there's something wrong. I want to get behind the scenes of the police investigation. These hours of tapes offer a unique insight into how forensics and crime scene evidence are pieced together and, crucially, how detectives extract the truth in the interrogation room. This interview is being digitally recorded at Patchway Police Station in Bristol. It's a continuation of the interview. With privileged access to the police tapes from this disturbing case, I'm meeting one of the lead detectives in the Becky Watts inquiry. He'll tell me the inside story of the biggest investigation ever tackled by Avon and Somerset police. In this area, how many teenagers go missing? So on a, on a daily basis, you know, certainly dozens. The vast majority um, either found by the police or found by friends and family or they return of their own volition. What is the trigger point for actually treating this, not as a missing person's inquiry, but as someone who might have come to harm? In Becky's case, it was around the fact that her social media had become very inactive, that her laptop, her tablet computer was missing, and her mobile phone. Um, she had a group of friends, um, a really nice group of friends that actually she was regularly in contact with and all of that ceased. I was saying on day one, you know, I'm fairly confident here that something bad has happened to this young lady. I just don't know exactly what. Police are tonight growing increasingly concerned about a teenage girl. Becky Watts, who's 16, was last seen at her Bristol home. She told no one where she was going when she disappeared. 
Becky's father, Darren, and stepmother, Angie, still live in the house where Becky grew up and from where she went missing. They've agreed to share with me what happened from the moment Becky disappeared. Hi, Darren, hello. hi, Susanna. This is Becky on Christmas Day, three years before she went missing. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is her father, Darren. Oh, yeah. And her stepmother, Angie. They'd lived together since Becky was two. When Darren made the 999 call, the family were becoming desperate. What was it that set alarm bells ringing for you? Um, it was when her friends turn up looking for her and then I rang Darren because all her friends were here and she wasn't. I'm panicking at, at this point because I, I know there's so much seriously. I went up in her bedroom, I had to look around see if I could see anything different. This is so far out of her character that there is no way she has done this. Something has happened and I don't know where she is, and we need to find her, and we need to find her fast. With no sign of her in Bristol, DCI Richard Ocone calls in the national media, hoping to make contact with Becky or anyone with her. Bex, if you're uh, watching this, please come home. We love you so much. They still thought she was staying somewhere, to be honest. I still thought she might be staying somewhere. I don't know if it's wishful thinking. Thank you. Thank you. It was so loved, and I don't think you believe that. You really are so loved. I'm looking for that. Please come home, or whoever's sheltering her, do the right thing. Thank you. On the Monday, uh, I'd had the, the, the media in, done the initial media release, and by that point, on the Tuesday, the media had descended on Bristol. Um, the pressure around that had it, it, it increased immensely. The family home is really the last place of reference, the last point of reference that we can actually place her at. And clearly, we're trying to look at what happened after she left the family home on the 19th of February, so last Thursday morning. I think the fact that it was such a conundrum initially around, OK, well, what's happened here? Uh, but I think that's probably what gripped the nation. And, of course, at various points, the case then changed. And I think that then held the attention of the media for such a long period of time. Away from the media campaign, the police tapes show the detectives' first move is to question the people closest to Becky. They carefully avoid anyone feeling accused of wrongdoing, so everyone talks freely helping police find out more about the missing girl. Those interviews really were about background, about what we call victimology. So what did Becky like? What didn't she like? Where did she go? Who were her friends? Who were her associates? What were her phone numbers? Do you know whether she uses WhatsApp? Yeah. She does. So you and her would normally be through text yeah. and um, Facebook, Messenger. Mm -hmm. We were able to look for any things that didn't fit with the norm, so patterns that didn't fit with a normal week or accounts from what had happened in the critical day that, again, didn't, didn't seem right. Shauna heard the door go, so I, she was assuming it was Becky going out. Yeah. So I'm assuming it was Becky going out. Okay. We'd also involved when did you last see her? Uh, when did you last have contact with her, which clearly in this case was really important because we had that line in the sand on the Thursday morning and we were looking to try and get beyond that line if we could. No one saw her go, but no. just heard the door go yeah. and the assumption that Becky had left yeah. the house. Okay. As the police check alibis from her friends and family for the day she went missing, they discover that Becky's stepbrother Nathan and his girlfriend Shauna were at Becky's house and were the last people to see her. Um, can you tell us your full name, please? Um, it's Shauna Stacey Charmaine Hoare. OK. I'll just scroll that down. Nathan Charles Matthews. OK, that'll be... And, um, all right to call you Nathan? 
Yeah, OK, I'm fine to be quiet. Detectives now want to know everything about this last sighting. But it's been difficult even getting the couple to the station. Nathan and Shauna were the only two people that we interviewed that were actually difficult to pin down. Does that raise a red flag with you? Of course, uh, if you've got a, a, you know, witnesses or, or people that are within your investigation that don't appear to want to meet you, it's always going to cause you some concerns. Um, but I'd like you to take yourself back to that day, if you could, and if you could just talk us through what happened in as much detail as you can remember. OK, OK. Um, we, me and Nathan, we were, we rang Angie. Yeah to see if she was going to be in that day. Shauna being interviewed, the report coming back from the, the, the interview advisor was that uh, in terms of the way she presented, she was giggly, was quite uh, sort of light-hearted, perhaps not in keeping with the serious nature of what was actually taking place at that point and the fact that Becky was still missing. And she asked me if Becky had gone out and I said, yeah, I heard the door go. She must have gone out earlier. When you heard that, is your thought are you thinking that's the front door that's slammed? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and who did you think that was then? Well, Becky. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nathan came across as, as, uh, as fairly unconcerned. He's looking so relaxed. He's totally laid back, he's in control, and he's, uh, he's, he's very, very comfortable in his surroundings. Even laughing and joking. Yes. Police become even more worried as the couple start to give their version of what happened the day Becky went missing. Then I heard the front door slam. Um, carried on washing my hands, went into the living room. They were really consistent in their accounts. However, the detective side of your brain was also saying they fit together really conveniently and really, really neatly. Even the best witnesses will provide uh, accounts which are factually incorrect. Um, and in this case, it's slotted together very, very neatly. And what did that suggest? They indicated to me collusion. They've basically talked to each They've other. They've talked after to each the other. They've got their stories straight and actually made sure that it fitted neatly. I mean, I think what we'll do is we'll probably wrap the interview up. No, we've been talking for two hours. It's quite a long time. Um, My back's killing. So. I know. But at that stage, we didn't have any tangible evidence other than that you're kind of senses as a detective, as an investigator. I got a slight headache, just trying yeah, to remember. I know. Use okay. a lot of brain power. The interview team are suspicious, but they need more than gut feeling before they can act. So, as the Major Crimes Unit is brought on board, they look to forensics to uncover the evidence they need. The answers are always out there. The answers are always there. I'm a great believer in the fact that it is always out there and I'm constantly telling my team, you know, OK, we need to keep plugging, we need to keep plugging. If it's not in the witnesses, it'll be in the phone work. If it's not in the phone work, it'll be in the CCTV inquiries. With a county-wide search and a national media campaign still ongoing, the forensics team is sent back into Becky's house where she was last seen. That's when we came across what appeared to be um, blood or red staining um, on the architrave of the door frame leading into Becky's room. It's very, very difficult to see with the naked eye. Some of it was down very low, some of it was about waist height, and some of it was a, approximately shoulder height. So the three different heights um, did seem to strike a chord in terms of, um, well, how, what, why, you know, had there been a struggle? And within that blood staining is uh, finger marks, so fingerprints to what we call ridge de detail within the police. Police and family must now wait to see if this discovery will take them closer to finding out what has happened to Becky. The search for Becky Watts continued today. Family and friends scouring the parkland and woods near her Bristol home, hopeful they will find the 16-year-old safe and well. Becky has now been missing for nine days. Detectives have no idea where she is, but forensics have had a breakthrough and are analysing a fingerprint and traces of blood found outside her bedroom. Meanwhile, police ask Becky's stepbrother Nathan and his girlfriend Shauna back to the station for more questions. The information that the investigators have within the team that are saying to me they're being evasive, they're the last people potentially to see 
uh, Becky alive, so they're quite significant, they're significant witnesses. And I think your experience as a detective shows you quite often those people that purport to be the last person to see the individual alive, potentially, are the suspects. Despite their suspicions, the police have no evidence to link the pair to Becky's disappearance. So they target Shauna to work out if the couple are holding anything back. Machine's recording. Has, he, has Nathan had any sort of concerns about speaking to us? Not that he's told me now. No. no. Okay. If he does, I wouldn't know then. Mm. <laughs> yeah. How, how is he finding it? Um, he's found it quite hard, actually. Yeah. yeah. Or again, knowing how hard it'd be for his mum at the moment. You know, because Becky was almost like her daughter, a daughter to her. Yeah. You know, and it has been very stressful for Angie. In another interview room, Nathan is giving a different account of the family dynamics. So how would you describe your relationship with Becky? Mm. Didn't particularly talk to her, but obviously I don't particularly like her. And obviously what annoys me is the way she speaks to like my mum sometimes. Mm. She'd be kind of like rude or whatever, I'm trying to think of an actual specific time. Um, it's a revelation, but it's not enough to detain him. Then the investigation takes a dramatic turn. Forensics come back with their first results. The fingerprint in the blood belongs to Nathan. Everything needs to be put in context. The context here was Nathan and Becky didn't appear to get on. And this is the advantage of the, uh, the, the significant witness interviews and building that victimology and building that picture. So how could that blood be in with his fingerprint in upstairs on the first floor, a location that we don't think Nathan went frequently. So that's the first real big turning point. It will take another 12 hours for the DNA results to reveal whose blood it is. This gives detectives time to plan their response. If it is Becky's blood with Nathan's fingerprint in it, we will arrest. We will arrest immediately. We will arrest for kidnap. The results come in. It's Becky's blood. An arrest team tracks down Nathan and Shauna to a suburb of Bristol. The police are still hoping to find Becky alive and now urgently need to question the couple. The reason I've come here is to make an arrest of yourself, OK? And what I'm going to do is explain everything here now, OK? Let's put your hands like that for me, all right? So the reason we arrested for kidnap at that point is we need to give ourselves the best possible opportunity we can possibly have of recovering her if she's still alive. And the whole investigation is just set up to make sure that if she's still alive, we save life. That's our primary objective. Won't be compliant and hit assist us, yeah? It was like seeing someone else's family go through it when I heard that two people had been arrested. The ages gave it away. I knew who it was before the police told me. And I can't say I was particularly surprised. If it was going to be something bad, it didn't surprise me. Nathan hated Becky and made it obvious. With just 24 hours by law to interview them, the tapes show how police have carefully planned their questioning to keep the suspects talking. And what we don't want to do is, is close her down. We want her to continue to talk, to continue to provide us with an account that we can then cross-check. Is there anything going on in that house that made you worried? No. Or concerned? No, everything seemed normal. Nothing seemed wrong, nothing, you know, it all seemed kind of the same as it would any other day. Tell me about Nathan and Shauna's characters that emerged in the interviews that helped police devise the strategy to get the truth out of them. OK, so I think dealing with Shauna first, she's quite a confident person. She is quite an articulate person, comes across uh, very well. And um, it was, I was in the kitchen when I heard the door slam and I carried on. And as I went back in the living room, he just kind of sat on the sofa 
think he's playing on his tablet. When there's significant witnesses, it's more about trying to take the accounts from them, whereas now we can ask more pressing questions around, well, why did you do that? How did you do that? So what were you doing there? Sort of far more incisive. Have you got any concerns or suspicions that Nathan or any other member of your family or extended family might be responsible for her disappearance? No. No. Why are you so sure? Because none of them is likely to produce anything like that. What comes across quite quickly is that she is telling a series of lies and she's telling them very compellingly. Uh, and then you, you're into the situation where she's providing the account and you know she's lying. Is there anything that happened that could be significant in the disappearance of Rebecca? No. Are you absolutely sure? Yes. I know you've got mm. something to tell us. Mm. I can see it in your face. I was just making sure there was nothing, like a weird significant thing that I hadn't thought of. Um, but I don't know anything. Of course we're still hopeful that Becky might still be found alive, safe and well. But as time goes on, um, hope of course does fade. Um, and we're getting further along the line of interviewing Nathan and Shauna. Nathan was a far more complex uh, individual. I don't believe would have responded well to confrontation or conflict within an interview. So again, the, the strategy that we had was one that allowed him to talk, and he talked quite confidently. He wanted to have control or feel like he had control over the interview. You were at the address at the time that Rebecca or Becky, I think most people know Becky, her. Yeah. yeah, Becky. Or Bex. Sure. Yeah, OK. Do you know her as Becky or Bex? Uh, usually call her Bex. After luring Nathan in by giving him a sense of control, the interview team changed tack and challenged him directly. What we're most interested in is finding Becky. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what the police want to do. Yeah. So what can you tonight tell us about Becky's disappearance? As in, like, what, what do you want to know? We want to like, find her. Where is she? I don't know where she is. Is she safe? Well, I don't know where she is, so I'm meant to know. Do you know if she's alive? Well, no. <laughs> Have you hurt her? No, I haven't hurt her. The investigation now gathers speed, and with Nathan and Shauna under arrest, police move to search their house, just over a mile from Becky's home. Cotton Mill Lane, this is something that sticks with me and will stick with me throughout my career, I've no doubt about that. Approaching the address. Hello, police. There's still hope there that actually you're gonna find her and you're going to find her safe and well, or you're going to find her and actually she's only harmed a little bit and we can get her back to her family. Hello, police. Entering the house, opening front door alone is very challenging. It doesn't open properly because of the extent of the stuff behind the door. There are two fridge freezers behind the door. There's two steps of stairs. That's the uh, closet hallway. Room to the left, if it's a living area. Each room is jam-packed with material, particularly the lounge, particularly the kitchen, to the point where when the search teams initially go in, they don't realise there's an understairs toilet because they can't see the door in the hall. This leads into a, um, the kitchen area. There's no sign of Becky. But as the search goes on, Richard finds a corner of the house that immediately rings alarm bells. So I go upstairs, uh, turn right into the bathroom, then there's a cooker, there's a microwave. You can barely see the sink. The bath on the right-hand side is extremely clean to the point where it is very, very shiny. 
Um, you can actually see shapes in it with how shiny it is. So that is what sticks in your mind immediately. It's out of place in context with the rest of the address. Now clearly at that point I had no idea what was subsequently going to follow. Across this city there is an intensive search for clues, evidence being gathered in the hunt for a missing teenager. Police have been given more time to question two people in connection with the disappearance of 16-year-old Becky Watts. At this stage, the investigation is extremely fast-paced. There are other areas, so there's further forensic searches and examinations that are taking place. And all of that is feeding in to the interview coordinator, who's then able to pass it on to the interview teams. It must be a very sensitive balance how much information you provide those people that you're interviewing. There's a very fine balance, because if you give them too much, clearly they're in a position to amend their account to fit the evidence. If you give them too little, um, then they're probably not going to open up and talk to you, or they're going to be advised to offer no comment by a legal representative. So there is a really fine balance to be struck about how much we provide. This interview is being digitally recorded. It's been recorded audibly and visually. And I'm Marie Stephen, Detective Constable 3302. At this stage of the process, we've already thought ahead to what our strategy is for all of the interviews. We had decided as an interview team we would not disclose what the evidence was. Detectives don't tell Nathan they now know it's his fingerprints in Becky's blood. Instead, as their recordings show, they continue to hint at what they found to increase his unease. Did you go upstairs in the house that, at that time, before your mum came home on that Thursday? Mm, I'd say no, no. Don't, at, I can't remember, at most, if, if the, door, no, the door was shut. We have to expect that it will be running through their mind what have the police found? What do I need to explain away? Um, and without giving that to them on a plate, if you like, it leaves them having to think about it and puts them under more pressure. As the questioning in the interview room intensifies, the painstaking search through Nathan and Shauna's house continues. Two days in, the team finds some receipts, which take the investigation on a startling turn. The, uh, the search coordinator said, I've got these receipts, and showed me the photograph. And the receipts were within a, uh, an old changing unit, which was at the top of the stairs. Um, and those receipts indicated that somebody, uh, on the Friday when Becky was reported missing, somebody had been to uh, B&Q and had bought a circular saw, uh, some gloves, goggles, and a face mask. Now, that's a really significant moment for us because um, you're trying to figure out, well, what, what does that mean and where does that take us? Does it really mean that he has tried to dismember a body? That's a bombshell piece of Huge. evidence. The CCTV chillingly reveals that 24 hours after Becky was last seen alive, her stepbrother Nathan bought protective gloves, goggles, face masks and a circular saw. Um, the investigation has taken a really sinister, horrific turn and actually you believe now you're looking at a murder most definitely. It was the news the family had been dreading ever since Becky went missing. There is a moment when you are told that Nathan, a young man who you love and trust and care about, who is part of your family, who is your wife's son, is the man they believe has murdered your daughter. And that moment must have made your heart stop. It did, it did. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, your whole world just folds in on itself. They told me this is a murder inquiry. And I know I oh, started shouting at that point. It was, oh, no, 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 you're wrong. She's got to be alive. Already in custody for kidnap, 28-year-old Nathan 
and 21-year-old Shauna were now arrested on suspicion of murder. The police withheld their discovery of the receipt for the circular saw, but increased the pressure by telling Nathan that his home had been forensically searched. I think it, it probably felt like he was battling against a rising tide, and actually he could feel the evidence starting to come on top, and actually it was starting to, to weigh quite heavily. Um, so you're reaching that tipping point where he's thinking, OK, I've now got a few options, which is stop talking altogether, carry on as I'm going, which is deny, deny, deny. Or actually, I need to get to the point where I need to make some admissions. And I think the weight of the evidence at that point made the last option the only one that he had. At 10.26pm on day 11 of the investigation, Nathan gave police a statement through his lawyer. Very helpfully, um, we've been provided with a prepared written statement. Um, what we would like to do now, Nathan, is for that to be told on the interview recording. Do I have to actually listen to it? Can I put my fingers in my ears? Yep, I'll do that, thank you. I, Nathan Charles Matthews, accept I'm responsible for the death of Rebecca Watts. On the 19th of February, 2015, I attended Crown Hill, St. George, Bristol, with my girlfriend, Shauna Hoare. In my car, I had a large bag, a stun device, handcuffs, tape, and mask. I developed an idea to scare Rebecca by kidnapping her. I wanted to scare her and teach her a lesson. I believed that she was selfish and her behavior towards my mother was a risk to her health. A few minutes after arriving, Shauna said she wanted a cigarette and went into the garden. I went to the boot of my car, took out a bag that contained the items, then went upstairs to the landing before knocking on Rebecca's door. She replied, what, or hello, and I said, can I see you a minute? I cannot be sure which order things happened, but I used the items I had to subdue Rebecca. During the short struggle, my mask slipped and Rebecca was able to see my face. This caused me to panic and I strangled her while she was partially in the bag. There was a point where Nathan said that it had been an accident. He confessed to killing her, but he said it had, he'd not intended to. Was there part of you that wanted to believe that? I didn't believe that. What did you think? I thought he'd done it and he did it on purpose. Nathan went on to confess he'd used the circular saw to dismember Becky's body in the bath. He admitted then wrapping up the body parts putting them in boxes and bags and hiding them in a shed just a few hundred metres from his home. The, the nature of the find is, is horrific and shocking. I've, I've never dealt with anything like this. And it'll, it'll stay with me throughout my service. It'll stay with me probably throughout my life. After 12 days of hunting for Becky Watts, a private ambulance leaves the scene of a grim discovery. The find in a garden and terraced home on a small estate in Bristol was made by detectives last night. It was the outcome the teenager's family had prepared themselves for and feared most. This sort of thing happens to other people. It doesn't happen to us. But there we were in that situation. And then when we seen her in the morgue and that, that's when it really hit home then. I mean, they, they did, for police and more, they did their best to cover up her, where they'd cut her up and things like that. Um, but I could still see where they decapitated her. Uh, and and, and to, no, no parent should have to see that. Yesterday, Nathan, you very kindly gave us a fairly lengthy prepared statement through your solicitor, and we've had time to read that. 
A prepared statement is rarely the whole truth. And there may be a number of reasons why he's chosen to give us the account that he has in the way that he has. Now, that could well be, and is likely to be, because he wants to downplay perhaps the violence that he's used or how long um, it took for Becky to come to her death. But another really obvious factor would be that he has quite clearly excluded Shauna from being involved in anything that happened or even having knowledge of anything that happened when Becky was killed or when Becky was dismembered and disposed of. We have to be careful not to take that prepared statement on face value. We have to investigate this whole offence and, of course, whilst you're being interviewed, Shauna is yeah, also I, I being know, interviewed. I know Shauna's being interviewed. I'm yeah. going to talk about Shauna. So you don't want to? OK. He's trying to take the heat away from her. It was almost like there was an agreed path that they were going to walk, that they were going to lie to a certain point. If he came on top, Nathan would accept culpability. He says that he killed Becky whilst he was at the address on the estate, OK? The focus switched to Shauna um, and trying to unpick some of her, her deception, some of her lies, some of her concealment. What's your knowledge of him killing Becky? Found out yesterday morning. You found out yesterday morning? Um, prior to that, I had no idea that he had any involvement in anything at all. They both stuck to their stories. His was ridiculous, hers was cold and calculating. She's the brains. Has Becky stood up, Nathan, whilst you were strangling her? No comment. <clears throat> to what degree was she incapacitated then? No comment. Was she conscious at the time that you strangled her? <laughs> no, <coughs> no comment. Twelve days after Becky went missing, Nathan had confessed to killing his stepsister. But he was insisting he had acted alone. Detectives were certain his girlfriend Shauna had played a part and now focused their investigation on proving she was involved. This is what made it quite challenging, actually, because Nathan's account is one which is built on truth but actually has a number of lies within it, whereas Shauna's is lies throughout from start to finish. What did Nathan say about Shauna's involvement in Becky's death? He effectively said that Shauna had no knowledge of Becky's death and no involvement. Did you believe that at the time? No. It, it just seemed so implausible. We knew that Shauna had lied about a number of different things uh, during the course of her accounts. Um, and it just seemed so, given the circumstances under which Nathan was explaining that the murder had occurred, it just seemed incomprehensible. And how do we know you weren't involved in the, the killing of Becky? Because there would be no proof. Mm -hmm. I haven't touched anything or been anywhere near her alive or dead. After questioning both suspects for the maximum 96 hours allowed by law, Nathan was charged with Becky's murder and remanded in custody, awaiting trial. Detectives still couldn't link Shauna to the murder, but they wanted to keep her detained while they searched for the evidence they were convinced existed. Shauna, we weren't in a position where we could link her directly to the murder, but we could evidence her lying. So the outcome of that was that we charged Shauna with perverting the course of justice initially. The time by the interview clock is 19.10, and this interview is suspended. Police had been desperate to prove Shauna had been involved in Becky's murder. The couple's many phones and computers were scoured, and DNA samples sent to the lab. Then, in a shocking development, a series of deleted texts were recovered from one of Shauna's phones. They revealed for the first time the disturbing motivation behind 16-year-old Becky's murder. So this evidence, when it came back off of Nathan and Shauna's primary phone numbers, was absolutely crucial. And what did their phone records and internet searches suggest? So it showed uh, internet searching of uh, pornographic material, 
of around Becky's age, um, but it also showed some text messaging between the two of them where they were talking about young females, uh, potentially abducting a young female, uh, and taking them back to their home address and putting them in, in their loft. The police brought in Shauna from remand for further questioning about this worrying new evidence of a sexual motivation to the murder. So the first message is uh, 9th of 12th, 2014, uh, timed at 12.48, and it says to Shauna, and um, it says, fuck you, bring me back two pretty schoolgirls then. D1, I think that says. Tell me about that text message. No comment. I mean, it must have been a huge moment when you realised there were texts between Nathan and Shauna... Yes. ..discussing sick fantasies about teenage yeah. girls. Yes, it was. And, and, and those texts, some of them have been deleted, so actually they weren't easy to come by. Next message is 9th of December 2014, at 18.14. It says from Shauna. Just went to cost cutters and saw a very, in big caps, pretty, pretty petite girl. Almost knocked her out to bring her home. L-O-L. And there's crosses and zeros. Shauna, what can you tell me about that? No comment. Am I right in thinking that this girl was similar to Becca's age? No comment. What did they tell you about Shauna? Uh, I think they, they showed that Shauna's involvement was, was far tighter, far closer to actually what had happened than she was portraying. Uh, bearing in mind that she was still maintaining a complete lack of knowledge and it also flew in the face of the account being provided by Nathan, which was that Shauna had no involvement. Forensics then made a horrifying discovery. Shauna's DNA was on a face mask and on a bag containing Becky's remains. What did that suggest Shauna had been doing? It, it suggested that she'd been involved in the dismemberment and the packaging of Becky after she'd been killed. And again, a really significant moment because that's the first time we could tie Shauna in directly to what had gone on after Becky had died. We were able to place Shauna and Nathan on a, on a level footing in terms of the charges, so they were both charged at the same, both charged with murder, both charged with averting course of justice, and actually the, the two sides of it were very, very balanced. At the trial, Nathan was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 33 years. Shauna was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to 17 years. They killed her at home in a sexually motivated attack and attempted to lie their way out of it. Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hoare are now both convicted killers of a young girl who was part of their family. Did it feel like justice to you? As investigators, we always put our, our cases in the hands of the jury system that we have in this country and also in the, the hands of, uh, of the judge who obviously oversees the trial. Mm -hmm. And I think in this case, having sat through that, sat through the evidence, I think they did a fantastic job. I loved Becky. I was proud of her. We had a very close relationship from the day she was born. and. There'll never be anyone quite like her. I believe they came both up here. They burst in on her. They masked them and attacked her. She must have been absolutely bloody terrified. The image I have in my nightmares is him holding her down on the floor and she's doing that over her mouth and nose. That's the image I get. Now, there was no evidence to suggest that's how it happened, but that is the image I get in my nightmares. They did it together. They planned it together. I don't know what they expected to gain from it because there was nothing in it for them. So, 
it was all pointless.